Hello, everybody. Uh, well, welcome to week three in our 40 days of community. Uh, how we're becoming better together. Today, we want to talk a little bit about the, the place generosity. That generosity is a pathway to community. That community grows as the direct result of living from a heart of generosity towards one another. As we contribute more, we connect deeper. Uh, one of the clearest things about this idea of community, it's interesting in the Greek, is that the word for community, koinonia, you may have heard it, but it has many different meanings. It means fellowship. It means partnership. But one of the literal meanings of the word koinonia is contributing. <laughs> that community is a joint contribution. <laughs> it is a sharing of our contribution together in, in a way that, that lifts all of us higher. You know, this is such a huge point. The way we belong is by helping each other belong. Giving is the way to community living. I often tell people, do you know when you really become a member of Heart for the World Church? It's not necessarily when you sign a card. When you really become a member of Heart for the World Church is when you make someone else belong. When you become a friend to someone else and they belong because of you, you belong. <laughs> because again, it's that whole idea that we, we unite by what we give, not by what we take. If you want a friend, be a friend and so forth. And uh, there's something just about giving that connects people. I, I thought this was interesting. Author Randy Frazee uh, talked about the connection between generosity and community in a book. He says, my neighbor asked me if, I could, if, I could, if he could borrow my ladder. I said, of course. I later learned he had one of his own. He didn't need to borrow my ladder. He just used it as a way to build our relationship. And when he borrowed my stuff, it made me feel that I was needed. And I like that feeling. I have now learned to do the same thing with my other neighbors. My other neighbor, Randy, has a shop vac, and I borrow it every Friday night to clean my car with my son. In fact, now Roger just leaves it out for me. I told Roger recently that I could afford to buy my own shop vac, but I just like the interaction of borrowing his. Roger's answer was, please don't buy a shop vac. <laughs> Isn't that true? Just as, as we share, give to each other, and receive from each other, it creates community. Now, when we see that early church in Acts 2.44, we see this example of people incredibly living out generosity towards one another. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. These people were were, were giving maniacs. I mean, they, they were all out to help each other. They had a garage sale or someone had a debt. I mean, they were just doing this. Now, what you need to know, this was not communism. I mean, communism is uh, what's yours is mine. <laughs> this wasn't that at all. This was Christianity. What's mine, I love to share. But the, the result of that is that it made a great impression on other people. The, the world around them noticed. And isn't this what Jesus said? They will know you're Christians by the way you love each other. I remember when I was moving in from one house to another at the church where I used to pastor in El Paso, and about 40 people showed up to help me on the day I moved. My neighbors couldn't believe it. And they said, who were these people? How could you hire so many people? I said, no, they're just my family. Wow, you have a big family. Oh, yeah, several hundred. That's called my church. And they said, I would like to go to a church like that because they saw community. Now, how does, how does this generosity flow? Well, it should flow out of the knowledge of a relationship with who God is and what Jesus has done for us. One of the important things that generosity comes is as we realize his nature, that God, though he's three persons, each of the other lives to lift the other. You know, if you read about Jesus and his relationship with the Father, the Father and the Holy Spirit, it's always the Father glorifies the Son and the Son wants to glorify the Father. And, and it's this incredible trinity. 
And, and when, when, the, when Jesus tried to describe what he wanted to happen within our church and our families, he said in John 17, 21, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Be one the way we are. One way I would describe the relationship of the Trinity is that each one is forever saying to the other, my dream is to make your dream come true. No, my dream is to make your dream. My dream isn't my dream. My dream is your dream. Your dream is my dream. No, no, my dream is your dream. If that ever would begin to come, that would change and revolutionize everything. And I can tell you the greatest treasure of my life is I have people who love me that much. Who, who literally say, my dream is, how can I help you, Dale, to realize your dreams? I remember when my kids were little, a precious lady who said, I just want to come every Tuesday so you and Sharon can go on a date. And when you have five kids under five years old, that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> People who say, even today, what can I take off your plate? That's what makes a church great. What would happen in your life group if truly your dream was to make the other? Maybe turn to someone right now and say, my dream is to make your dream come true. And point to all the people at your group right now. The second thing that would create a community of generosity is that our knowledge of the generosity of Jesus towards us. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it says, for you know the grace or generosity of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake, he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus modeled community by what he gave for us. Have you ever thought about this? Jesus, at the end of his life, he had only one possession. It was his robe, and he gave that up. And he went to a cross naked. He gave up the presence of God. My God, why is that? forsaken me. He did that for you. The Bible makes it clear the kind of love that creates community, as we've said, it comes from realizing how we are loved. And as we deeply and are grateful for the way he loves us, how generous he is towards us, that forms in us a heart towards each other. Because you see, Jesus made one simple request if you appreciate what I did for you, if, if that matters to you, would you fulfill my joy? Would you pay me back by treating each other that way? That's how you'll pay me back. Now, here's some ways to grow community through gener uh, generosity. Number one, pay attention to ways quietly to help meet other people's needs. We're to tune in. Now, what I see here is, is the idea that we quietly discern. The church isn't a place where people have to ask for things. The church is a place where people become sensitive. They, they know what you need because they're intentionally spending time thinking about others instead of just themselves. And so they sense when you're a little burned out. Maybe they sense, boy, I think bringing a meal to your house would be huge. Or I sense it would be very helpful if I came and helped you clean up all those weeds because you've got a problem with your back or hundreds of ways that we could help each other. But the key is that we don't make each other ask. In fact, one of the, the things that we want to be careful of is that we never take advantage of others' generosity. That's why we encourage people not to ask for things from each other that can easily lead to wrong kinds of relationships. But what we do say is, well, what if we just sensed and we're, we're just beginning to tune in to practical ways? You might just tune in to the fact someone would like to have someone sit on there, maybe new in town, they're a single adult. It would just feel real good if, if, if you, they could sit with you every Sunday at church or if they could go out to lunch after church sometime. This sensitivity, a huge way this is expressed is, as I say, giving together. We're going to talk about that when we talk about reaching out to our community. One of the, the greatest bonding things I've ever seen is when groups go on an outreach together or go on a mission trip. Man, wouldn't it be incredible this Christmas if your whole group 
went to Acuna, Mexico to give out toys to kids. You would come back so close, it would blow your mind. Another way we show generosity is by giving affirmation and encouragement. Hebrews 3.13 says, But encourage one another daily. Could you circle the word daily? As long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. What it says here is that encouragement is the antidote to hardness and harshness and brittleness. That when we're encouraged, it softens our hearts, makes us more responsive to God as well as to each other. I think it's so interesting that he says encouragement is one of our number one defenses against sin. Most of the time when we, we fall into temptation, it's often because we've, we've wondered we're, we're in a place of loneliness, isolation. We're feeling discouraged. I don't know about you, but I'm most vulnerable when I'm discouraged. And yet, if we encourage each other, the chances of us making the high choice become so much greater. Encouragement brings life to our hearts. I don't know why, but as human beings, we were made for affirmation. I often joke, it's just amazing to me. Some people are so scarce and stingy with their compliments, you'd think they're paying money to give one, you know? But have you ever thought about how, how cheap compliments, I mean, I don't mean in the negative, I mean, how easy it is just to take the second to affirm someone, and yet how often we pass that up? I was in a group of pastors, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, one of, one of the guys that's been a friend for mine for many years, he said, hey, everybody, I just wanted to tell you about Dale. You know, he sacrificed a lot. He's planted a, a different churches and sent off people, and I just had to tell everybody I'm so proud of him. Now, I didn't need him to say that, and yet all I can tell you is I was deeply touched. I, I was different from that moment. He was just saying something took him 30, you know, 30 seconds. But boy, did it make a difference. Affirmation calls out who we are. I like this verse in Philemon 1.6. It says, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in us in Christ. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. He says that Philemon he says, boy, as you acknowledge everything that's good in each other or in Christ, your faith literally, in the Greek, your faith, he says, energizes. It, it, it catches fire. There, there's an, a, a, another level of faith. One of the reasons that's true is because the best way for us to come to know our identity in Christ is when we find it in the eyes of other people, when they see who we are and they affirm it. When we discover and call out one another, I, I'll never forget a professor named Pastor Dennis. When I'm 19 years old, he just comes up to me and says, Dale, you have an unusual gift to, to communicate the word of God. God's going to use you to preach in a great way someday. I mean, all of a sudden I said, you think I'm really a preacher? Well, here is someone who's a great preacher and he thinks I'm a preacher. Suddenly I had faith to rise to that in, in a beautiful way. Even in little ways, I was thinking a silly story when I'm like 12 years old, I kind of struggle with my looks. When I was a little kid, I had a great big head. My body had to grow into it. That's why some of them kind of called me Jughead, but all this. And I had a friend named Lonnie, and right when we were 10 or 12 years old, he had a big sister about 20 years old. She was a pretty girl and everything. And she just, one day we were together, and she says, Dale, you just got to know, you're a very attractive boy. And you know, from that day on, I said, wow. If that good-looking girl thought I was attractive, maybe I am not ugly after all. Anyhow, silly, but how powerful and how easy, important it is to affirm each other. What if we did that every day like the Bible says? Number three, be generous in giving forbearance and showing patience and believing the best about each other. I really wanted to mention this, this word forbearance because I think it's a huge word in the study of love. The word literally means slippage or giving people margins. Uh, the picture of that is as, a, as people are mountain climbers, you know, they're tied to each other in ropes, but those ropes are not simply, you know, tight between one and another. If, if one person falls, have you ever noticed there's sort of a, there's the, 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 the device 
that allows for there to be slippage because there would be a need for slippage or else the whole party might fall down. And, and one of the, the biggest things the Bible says towards each other is that we need to create relationships in which there's a lot of room for people to grow, to learn, to make mistakes, to get back up. There's a, there's a lot of mercy. There's a lot of patience. I like this verse in Colossians 3.12 that says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, if anyone has a complaint against the other. How many know we often get complaints against each other? What does it say to do? Bear. Did you notice how many in the love chapter the verses are? Love is patient. Love bears all things. Love endures all things. That is why this is, this is at the very heart of, of generosity. Being generous with your patience, in a, many cases, is more valuable than being generous with money because it gives people the chance to grow and learn and change. I like this verse in Proverbs uh, 19.11. It says, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. In Proverbs 17.9, it says, he who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Have you ever just felt the power of mercy? Someone who didn't give up on you, someone who put up with you. Just think about how merciful God is with us. Think of how merciful Jesus was with his disciples. <laughs> over and over, they, they, they stumbled, they fell, and yet Jesus never gave up on them. He said to Peter, you're a rock. <laughs> Peter, uh, I believe in you. Peter, I've prayed for you. You're gonna fall, but I've prayed for you. And when you return, teach your brothers also. I remember again, at the time I'm a little boy and my older brother, Jerry, I was always getting in trouble. And it's just so silly, but I'm probably six years old and he comes and he says, Dale, I want you to know, I know you're really a really good boy. You just mess up a lot. I don't know what that did for me, but all of a sudden I realized, here's someone who was gonna, who's gonna give me a lot of margin. I think I can grow up with that. This often becomes tested when people talk to us about other people. How many know that happens everywhere? When we hear gossip, here's one of the biggest things. When someone comes and says, did you hear what so-and-so did? Boy, this is a critical moment. We often say around here, every one of us carry in our hands a bucket of gasoline and a bucket of water, and, and we're gonna come across fires. And, and what? God wants us to do is pour water on that fire. What some people do is they pour gasoline and the fire just gets terrible, you know. And so someone is going to come to you and say, did you hear, you know, what Pastor Joey did? Did you hear what she said? Well, this becomes a critical moment. And one thing I've learned about people, we're very, we're very often willing to judge ourselves based upon our motives, but judge other people based on their performance. You know, we say, well, I didn't mean that, but you lied, you know, whatever. But God wants us to reverse that, to affirm people's hearts, even if we can't agree with their actions. What a powerful thing it is to say, well, I don't know about all of this, but can I tell you, I know Mary's heart. Here's Mary's heart. That's called forbearance. And the last one, uh, expression of generosity, is to be generously forgiving. Ephesians 4.32 says, Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God and Christ has forgiven you. This is an incredibly important issue because as I, I put in here, forgiveness is one of the most costly and crucial gifts in community. Without forgiveness, community can't happen. This is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> community is going to suffer with the reality that we're going to be offended. Jesus said in Luke 17, one, 
offenses must come. <laughs> okay, they're coming. As we joke around here, where two or three are gathered together, someone's going to get mad. It's just a matter of time. As we face this issue of you offended me, we will either end community and divide it, or we will grow through it. You see, someone said successful people don't fail less. They fail their way to success. <laughs> they, they learn through failure. They learn through that. And that's the same way in our relationships. The issue is not we'll never fail each other. The issue is will we grow through that failure? You know, as, as the, all the studies show that the difference between a successful and unsuccessful marriage isn't that a successful marriage has fewer arguments than an unsuccessful. They have the same amount of disagreement. They just handle it differently. They just grow. They just reconcile instead of resent, instead of seeking revenge, instead of going silent, instead of cutting off. They run to the funk instead of running from it. Here's another observation about forgiveness. It needs to be purposeful and continuous. I love this verse in Mark 11, 25 that says, When you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you. To sign up for community means to sign up for a daily life of forgiveness. Martin Luther King Jr. used to say, don't just forgive, live with a spirit of forgiveness. Forgive in advance. Be a forgiver. Do not let the sun go down on your ass. You know, I love the fact one, one of the principles my wife Sharon has, she will not go to bed with dirty dishes still anywhere on the kitchen table or on the sink. No matter how late, she says, I never want to have a dirty dish because it's harder to clean to wake up in the morning to dirty dishes. Isn't that an amazing way to take care of your heart? So it says, whenever you pray, just go through, God, I forgive, I ask for forgiveness, and I forgive my community, so that nothing could stop the flow of your love. Forgiveness is, is often costly. Often it involves a process. It is a commitment that doesn't always happen just by trying. It often requires a tremendous amount of grace because we really get hurt and wounded. How do we forgive? Let me just go through some simple steps. Number one, admit to God when you're offended, take it to the Lord. Take off your mask, get real before the Lord. Just, just be honest, God, I need your help right now. Don't take it to a bunch of other people, take it to God. Number two, choose to forgive and begin to speak it out in your heart. Lord, I forgive them. I speak to this mountain of hurt, disappointment, be moved. Forgive people for the sins of commission and omission that they, they neglected you. Forgive. Choose to determine to base the price of your forgiveness not on what they would pay, but on what Jesus Christ already paid. See, you can't forgive if you're waiting for them to see that they need to ask forgiveness. Or you can't forgive if they have to suffer. You can only forgive if you settle in your heart, the price Jesus paid for their sin is already enough. Affirm that God can use this hurt for good, that you're going to press through this. And ask God if with this forgiveness there's a step to reconcile the wrong. Now there are times when things happen and we are just overlooking that. And again, it's, it's the first step. God, I forget before this even, this day is over. Many times, that's it. It's over. We can just go on. But if we come and notice something's changed in our relationship with that person, there's a tenseness, there's a coldness. Or, or if we know that what that person's done, it would be better for the community for that to be addressed, then, then love says we need to have a reconciliation. Matthew 18, 15 says very, very clearly that we're to go in a spirit of gentleness and humility for the sake of community and for the sake of what God wants to do, we're to seek to ask forgiveness, first of all, and to seek a way to bring light, not to bring accusation or judgment, not to condemn or slam or shame, but to ask if we could bring to light 
anything that has begun to cause a distance in our relationship? Would they be willing for us to have a discussion in a way that could, could vet, uh, take apart what's happened in our relationship so that we could come to a place of peace, allowing the bygones to be God, bygones? This is the most mature, most God-fearing, God-honoring kind of community when two brothers or sisters, sisters and sisters, brothers and brothers, go through the fire and seek to find that reconciliation. I can tell you today, some of the deepest relationships I have went through the fire, but by the grace and mercy of God, we had found reconciliation and forgiveness. God bless you as you share on how God wants you to be generous in your, your love for each other. Amen.